I'm Nadja Swart for biznews.com and joining me today is Dr. Imran Maya, a world-renowned gastroenterologist and neuroscientist and a pioneer of medical research into brain-gut interactions. Dr. Maya, it's a pleasure to be speaking with you today. Hi Nadia, thanks for having me on the show. Look forward to it. You are currently, and I'm going to read this, a distinguished research professor in the departments of medicine, physiology, and psychiatry at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA, executive director of the G. Oppenheimer Center for Neurobiology of Stress and Resilience, and founding director of the UCLA Brain Gut Microbiome Center. (laughs) This is remarkable by any standards. Can you Tell me about your background and how you got here. Um, well, I mean, I could give you the long story, you know, dating back to <clears throat> to my decision to go into medicine. Um, um, but I don't want to bore your your listeners with that. Um, so um, I got my medical degree and um, I did a four year uh, dissertation work at the Physiology Institute in, in, in Munich on brain-heart interactions. Um, then I did my residency um, in Vancouver at the University of British Columbia and before coming to, to UCLA. And I've trained in gastroenterology and then took a faculty position here um, at, at, at UCLA. From the beginning, <clears throat> I would even say from the beginning, when I made the decision to go into medical school, I've always been interested in in the brain body or mind body interaction, and as I mentioned, I've pursued this initially about brain heart interactions, but then I found gastroenterology as a clinical specialty more interesting, and have pursued this ever since. And initially, that was a topic that was not very popular. Um, it's hard to believe today where everybody talks about the brain gut or the mind gut connection. <laughs> And, um, you know, then about 10 years ago when microbiome science kind of exploded um, and the first studies came out that the, the microbes living in the gut actually participate in this, com- in this gut-brain communication, that's when, you know, I changed my, my, my research focus or broadened my research focus to include... Um, what I now call the the brain gut microbiome system because it's it's all these interconnected loops that connect these three areas in in our body, and so I've pursued this both in my clinical practice, patients with disorders of brain gut interactions, uh, but also with our research program and um, you know our, our our research centers that I've founded along the way and. Um, so, yeah, so that's, that's where we are. The terms gut instinct, gut feelings, yeah, they have been used broadly for years and years, probably without a scientific understanding of what they really mean. So I think it would be helpful if you can explain the scientific basis of these terms. Yeah, so this has really fascinated me, how people have come up with... Uh, so, you know, in, in, in Western medicine and in, in amongst the lay public, you know, this expression, gut feelings, gut-based decisions is so common. When I wrote my book, The Mind-Gut Connection, paid a lot of attention to this. There was not a day that you didn't see in the media that somebody, a prominent athlete or politicians used that term. And it's just really surprising because, I mean, there hasn't been really a specific science behind that. There are these kind of expressions, uh, you know, that we have in our common language that link uh, that link organs or systems, biological systems, with 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 emotions like a heartache or, uh, you know, this is a pain in the neck. I mean, there's a lot of those expressions that I think come more from the experience that people have had over hundreds of years. Particularly interesting systems, health systems are the Ayurvedic and the traditional Chinese medicine. They have a lot of those things in it that 
are not based on science, but on hundreds of thousands of years of observation, of clinical observation. So coming to the science of it, <clears throat> um, so people use this gut feelings and gut sensations in, in really in really two ways. One is to make decisions, um, these gut-based decisions. When you're unable to make a, the opposite would be the rational, um, you know, the, the pure rational decision based on plus and minus lists. And it's kind of a tedious process to go through these. And often at the end of this process, you're still not ready to make that final step and make that decision. Mm. Um, but it's also the other side is, um, you know, gut feelings so that you experience it's the, the famous butterflies in your stomach when, you know, on your first date or when before you have to give a talk, which, which is somewhat different, you know. So I want to start with the easier one and where we have some science is the gut feelings. I mean, the brain the emotional processes that go on in the brain, often we don't even notice them, but they're often expressed in our facial expressions. Uh, if you get good in it, you can actually tell if somebody is, is angry or sad or, you know, and it's universal. It's a biological phenomenon. So, but what we don't know that, or what most people don't know that the same way the brain sends these signals to the muscles in your face to create these facial expressions. It also sends them down to the digestive system from the stomach all the way down to the end of your intestine <clears throat> and influences just about all the gut functions from secretion of acid, mucus, uh, blood flow, contractions, um, transit. And most of these things are normally not consciously perceived because you would go crazy. Uh, <clears throat> but we have sensors in our, um, the vagus nerve is a big part of this. Mm -hmm. um, we have sensors now got, which report these, these activities, these emotion related activities back to the brain. And then you create this, this feedback loop, you know, that you have emotions in the brain may not be conscious, creating a mirror image in the gut. And that feeds back. So when somebody has gut feelings, I mean, so the easiest one are, are these uh, these butterflies that come, can be good or negative things. Um, they really are a reflection of arousal systems in the brain that go through this process and send your signals back to the gut and, and back up to the brain. Um, but we, we can assume, and that's less studied, that um, you know, happiness, falling in love. Um, we, we know more about the negative sensations um, or, or negative feelings, anxiety, stress, anger. Um, they all have go through this process. So the brain and the gut is really one system, you know, and we know this from evolution. They evolved from one single origin, which was the gut-based brain. And then later our uh, big brain developed. <clears throat> so I look at this, and this is why I call it system. It's it's one system. It's not like they're, they're, they're two independent uh, uh, components of our body, of our physiology. Mm. And um, we have some of these also about the heart, you know, some of these emotions of, of love and passion and um, that are associated with, with, um, Heart-related sensations, I'm not aware, and you know, I've I'm just not knowledgeable about this. What mechanisms exist with our heart? Maybe a similar thing that you know goes the brain to the heart and then back to to the brain. But um, people often think about artificial intelligence and what this could do, like the um, you know the brain in a jar. Um, it probably wouldn't work because you, you take away half of that system. Okay. You know, you're not taking away the gut or, or the heart. You, you're taking away half of uh, an essential part of that system. Mm. Then coming to the gut-based decisions, that gets harder. Um, so every time these emotional moments that we go through from the time we're born and, 
you know, a crying as a baby, a negative emotions because the baby's hungry and then gets satiated after uh, being nursed. These emotions and their corresponding gut feelings get encoded somewhere in our nervous system. So we have these millions, possibly billions of minute, you know, recordings or um, emotional clips, video clips in our nervous system, a huge database. And one thing that I proposed in my book is what you do when you make a gut-based decision, you access these memory banks like a, like a search engine, um, which can within milliseconds come up with the right answer. So, you know, if, if, if you type in something in your Google search, you don't have to type in the whole word. The, the computer, the, the system knows this after the first few letters. <clears throat> and so this would be the equivalent of making this gut-based decision instantaneously, you know, um, without having to go through plus and minus considerations, which is a very slow process because that goes through your prefrontal cortex. Um, it's linear. It's it's It almost operates like an old-fashioned computer that we're no, no longer using, you know, whereas the gut-based decisions are really something that, um, you know, is similar to, to these search engines and supercomputers that we use in our technical world. I've had a look through the titles of, oh, it's an incredible body of work of papers that you have co-authored and one of them had to do with how early life adversity predicts brain gut alterations associated with increased stress and mood. Can you talk me through the findings of this paper? Yeah, so early life adversity and its, <clears throat> its role in shaping the stress responsiveness and stress perception is something that we have been interested for a long time and studied this in, in animal models. So some 20 years ago, a lot of research in psychiatry and biological psychiatry went into that, into that same question. Um, the models that were used was uh, separation of the litter from the mom for 90 minutes uh, every day, how that affected the, the stress responsiveness uh, of, of, of the offspring. And, you know, this was studied all the way down to molecular, to the molecular level, to epigenetics that, so we know how this programming of the stress system um, works in response to this early life uh, adversity. And early life could be all the way up to the age of 18 when the brain has fully developed, the prefrontal cortex has fully developed. Um, and it's it's a very common thing. If if you you know if if you take detailed histories of patients or even questionnaire studies, they found that um, a significant proportion of the healthy population has these early adverse life events, but a higher percentage of people with chronic diseases, anywhere from you know chronic from gut disorders like IBS to um, you know, heart disease have a similar kind of a, a, a pattern of this early programming. And two things have come out of this is one is, so what's, what's being programmed is how your brain response assesses stress. So the stress perception, if you expose a hundred people to the same kind of psychological stress, you know, they, they, they don't all, perceive that as stressful. So some, some would perceive it as just ignore it. Um, but for a significant proportion, probably 30%, they perceived it as stressful. And then not everybody has the same response in terms of the autonomic nervous system, like the sympathetic system and uh, uh, you know, what we call the HPA axis or cortisol response. So only a fraction has this hyper responsiveness. And there's a concept of resilience that is very important. If you think about like 
these millions of refugees, the, the, the tremendous trauma these, these children go through. Um, if, 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 human, if the human brain didn't have the mechanism of resilience, I mean, all these people would be compromised later in life, which I don't think is the case. So there's very successful um, people that come out of this, like the, the boat people in Vietnam, you know, in, in, in South Vietnam, like decades ago, but now all these other refugee waves. So, so the, so the brain has a, and even in, 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 in rats and in mice, the brain has a way of being resilient to these, to these early life influences. And um, so now we know that it's not only the brain that's programmed earlier in life, but also this affects the microbiome um, because, you know, these close connections. So these there's studies now that early adversity can also play a role in programming and shaping the, the gut microbiome composition and, and function. So those people that are affected would go through life with a greater risk of developing, you know, stress-related diseases uh, later on in life, together with a genetic predisposition. So if, you know, if you have a family history of, um, of Parkinson's disease or heart disease, if you had that early um, adversity experience, it will make the risk higher that you develop these diseases. Hmm. Just before we go further, in layman's terms, what exactly is the human microbiome? You know, it's been kind of, um, the use has been kind of sloppy. Initially, the microbiota are the microbes, the microorganisms that are there in, in, in the gut. And these are bacteria, fungi, and um, um, what we call archaea. Um, so most of them are, are, are bacteria. And when you use the term microbiome, it means also their genetic information, so their function. And... Um, the initial focus in this microbiome field has been on, on, on the microbes, who is there, the, you know, the players and people made all kinds of uh, erroneous extrapolations that if you test somebody's fecal material and you find certain microbes there, then this is, means, you know, this person has a high risk of disease or needs to change their diet. What we know today, it's really the function, you know, these, as opposed to our 20,000 human genes that we have, uh, these microbes together um, have millions, you know, like um, several millions of, of, of genes, many of which we don't know the function of um, when they're expressed. But it's, it's a tremendous reservoir of of, of being able to produce functional messengers and chemicals and, and signaling molecules that, <clears throat> that play a role. So the microbes, you know, to make one step back, why, why do they have all these genes? Um, well, the microbes were there billions of years ago, long before any animal or certainly long before humans came on the planet and they lived in the oceans. And during that time, um, they, they, they perfected the technique of communi communicating with each other um, and with their environment. And so that's where they accumulated all this wisdom, you know, and stored in their genes. When they, finally, when the first marine animals came, you know, appeared in the oceans and some microbes like some algae ended up inside these marine animals, inside the, the digestive system, they started exchanging gene material with, with the animal's nervous system and gradually transferred, you know, a significant portion of this genetic information to the host, the animal, and ultimately we inherited this in evolution. So the fact that, um, that the microbes can communicate with our gut and with our brain, um, it's not a coincidence. It, you can trace it all the way back to, you know, what these what these early microbes, how they interacted with with our 
um, you know, with the first animals on the on the on the planet. And going back to a short answer to your question, the function um, what most people today use to refer both to the individual microbes, but also their function is microbiome. It's it's you know people just put these two together into one term. A lot of your papers have been around you know research into irritable bowel syndrome and irritable bowel disorder. In late August, I interviewed Dr. Mark Pimentel, and he's also based in Los Angeles who said that IBS is in fact not a psychosomatic disorder as thought for decades, but rather a bacterial disorder. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think we have to be careful. You know, psychosomatic, you could say that was an early term for for brain-body, you know, interaction. And so we don't use the, the term um, psychosomatic because it has connotations of it's it's primarily psychological and as opposed to biological. And so I, I think where we're at today is, I mean, these are all, you know, biological processes. You know, you can't really... Um, now, what role each component has, you know, um, and what causality the components play from the brain to the gut to um, the microbes, there's still a matter of debate. You know, for example, most of the microbiome work has really been done, most of the fundamental and basic microbiome work has been done in animal models where you can um, much better test for causality. And that means knowing are certain symptoms or certain gut functions really influenced by these microbes? In in humans, that's much more difficult to do because you don't have the experimental possibilities to, to test this. We're getting a little bit closer to this, so you can have a patient, you take their fecal material, you analyze it, there's certain abnormalities, like a patient with depression or with irritable bowel syndrome, um, then you do a fecal microbial transplant. You take that stool sample and put it into a mouse. And then, uh, you know, some of these mouse models then develop features, behaviors, findings that are s taken as um, similar or analog to the human disease. Mm -hmm. But we have, we have not been able to do this in humans, obviously. You don't want to transplant, you know, something that could cause depression or irritable bowel syndrome just to somebody who is healthy. So uh, it could it could equally well be that the findings, many of the findings that we find in uh, the alterations in the microbiome are secondary to um, the influences from the brain. So like in depression, it could be that the changes in, in microbial composition and function are a reflection of the altered um, top-down regulation that the brain exerts over the gut microbiome. The same thing could be true in IBS, you know, that this increased stress responsiveness could change the, uh, the microbes. Virtually in all the human diseases, one could make that, that counter argument, you know, and, and there's a lot of studies going on to, to identify what's uh, the, the correct answer. I personally think it's, as I mentioned before, it's this circular interaction that both systems are involved. Which one starts first, like in anxiety disorders or in depression? My bias is it starts in the brain because we know a lot about this, you know, for 50 or 60 years. Um, biological psychiatry, neuroscience has made tremendous progress. And to all of a sudden throw this out and say it all starts with the microbes, I, I don't think we have the data to say that. Now, one thing that's interesting, uh, and maybe a potential exception, one thing that we've found that the microbial ecosystem in the gut does, it can play a role in 
inappropriately stimulating the immune system, which is located to 70% in the gut. And that would create an inflammatory environment in the gut, which then spreads throughout the body. If you have that situation for 30, 40 years, and then it affects the brain as well, it could well be that this is a, a mechanism that explains in a genetically predisposed individual the development of autism, of um, Alzheimer's disease and, and Parkinson's disease. So that I think is, these two disorders are kind of different. With the others, I think it's 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 this, these circular interactions that, that really explain currently our current finding the best. As you know, with science, it's always something you create a hypothesis and then you test it and you try to either prove it or falsify it and then you come up with a new hypothesis. So what I'm telling you today, you know, may not be, I, I wouldn't tell you in 10 years from now or in five years from now. In 2016, your book, The Mind-Gut Connection, which had to do with the hidden conversation within our bodies and how it impacts our mood, our choices, and our overall health was published. Can you talk me through the key findings and how microbial communication, to which you have referred, plays a part? It sort of comes back to this conversation we just had, you know, this discussion. Um, one thing that's really important to realize, and it certainly affected my my research interests, it all of a sudden has brought in diet as a major factor in our, you know, in, 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 in medical science and in disease. Um, because the, the microbes are the interface between the diet that comes in from the outside and what goes towards towards our body because the microbes translate information that's contained in the diet. Also in other things like chemicals or medications we take, it translates this into the language of the immune system and then, you know, from there throughout the body. So clearly this, this re-emphasis or this current, <clears throat> current emphasis on healthy nutrition and the bad influences of the standard American diet um, have gotten most of their momentum, really, I think, from the microbiome research and will continue to do so. Uh, so if we, you know, accept the fact, which there's many epidemiological studies and, uh, you know, cross-sectional studies on hundreds of thousands of patients, that diet is associated and a healthy diet is associated with better health, including brain health, and an unhealthy diet like the standard American diet with negative health outcomes. Uh, if we accept that, then, uh, you know, the microbes play a central role in this. Mm. And within that, within that field, the, the inflammation or the interaction with the immune system seems to be one of the key mechanisms. You know, I mean, the microbes do two things. One is they are the major factor that activates the immune system, but they also produce a lot of molecules and signaling molecules that are not inflammation related, but interact with inflammation um, somewhere on a particular organ, like the heart or the brain or, or the liver. So the combination of inflammation with these signaling molecules and the microbes is really what makes them so, so powerful in terms of influencing our health and, and our disease. This is gradually being recognized really now in science and medicine. You know, there's a renewed interest in diet. Um, most, I mean, I went to medical school without any training in diet whatsoever, even though I'm a gastroenterologist. And uh, that is changing now, you know, in, in all the disciplines, I think. Uh, so, it's it's an exciting this this may be the most exciting part of the microbiome science that we we now really look at uh, lifestyle um, lifestyle factors that are being translated by microbes into health and disease. I recognize that this must be a a very novel 
avenue of research, but have you in your research found that there may be a link between cancer and a loss of microbiome nutrients? Yeah, so there is definitely a link. Um, so I'm I'm most familiar with this for the colon cancer, mm -hmm. um, and you know we're something very similar. To what I just explained you this interactions of a low grade immune activation, so chronically inflamed colon and lining of the colon, um, an increase in permeability that uh, inflammatory molecules can actually get through the colon wall into the immune system and into uh, the rest of the body, um, that, that those are major mechanisms implicated in, in colon what we call carcinogenesis. And certain microbes have been identified that, that are more common in patients with, with colon cancer. Um, I'm always reluctant to sort of pin it down to one microbe because you know, that's really not the way it happens. It's always the community structure. But with colon cancer, both individual microbes, several of them have been identified that have an association with colon cancer as well as this low-grade inflammation. So colon cancer, the onset is happens in younger and younger people, as does many, as do many of these other chronic um, non-infectious diseases that fits this model, the unhealthy diet, unhealthy lifestyle in children with high rates of obesity already now in uh, childhood growing worldwide, um, that that creates a situation where we see these diseases, particularly like colon cancer at young and younger age. Interesting to me is how the medical system is responding to that. So, you know, the professional organizations of representing gastroenterology have just lowered the, the age limit for the age threshold for colon cancer screening to 45 years. That's not really going to help to decrease that increased prevalence, you know, that, that may uh, prevent to reduce who is going to die from colon cancer. But very little has happened and gastroenterologists to do these colonoscopies to not give dietary recommendations you know so if people are on the standard american diet they're after their screening colonoscopy they're not being told they're not even asked what they eat and they're not being told to change their diet mm. which is really sad you know i mean we, there's a huge potential where one could save lives and and healthcare expenditures mm. well, to sum up given the absence of vital advice after you know assistance from a gastroenterologist and certain procedures in terms of gastroenterology, what would you advise or promote as you know, vital ways to combat what we do know about the connection between colorectal cancer, as an example, and, and well, the gut microbiome? Yeah, so the, the, the key things would be... <clears throat> um, that you know there's counseling and first of all an assessment of this individual's lifestyle in terms of diet exercise um you know sleep hygiene um, uh, emotional well-being so that assessment it, it does happen like for example at ucla we have a, a group now that, uh, of specially trained uh, healthcare professionals that to make these assessments. And then I, I think the, the first, first step that I would recommend that is the most straightforward is to recommend a healthier diet, a change in diet. And um, almost universally, this is now being accepted that a, a largely plant-based diet was sort of 75% of the diet coming from, from plant-based foods. <clears throat> And you know, only thirty percent coming from from animal products, <clears throat> which includes which, which which should be not so much in terms of red meat, but um, poultry and, um, and 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 fish 
and seafood. <clears throat> that should be a universal recommendation. It's not easy for people who have developed their eating habits from childhood on. And, you know, they're culturally ingrained to eat red meat is obviously a, a manly, you know, trait that many men in the U.S. would never give up. Um, <clears throat> and women. <laughs> <laughs> so this is something <clears throat> I personally think an effort, a huge effort should be made to do that, you know, with and and then we'd have to start early on in life, you know, pregnant mothers because <clears throat> it also has an effect on the pregnant mother and how the the, the fetus develops and, uh, you know, health and brain of the newborn really starts in, 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 in utero and is influenced by the mother's diet. On that point, I have to ask, because I recently attended a lecture by uh, Dr. Zach Bush. He specializes in internal medicine and endocrinology, and he emphasized the difference between babies born via C-sections and natural birth and how those born via C-section, which is increasing the world over, are essentially robbed of the natural microbiota, if I'm saying that correctly, of uh, their mother's womb as they exit. What can you tell me about this? And is it as significant as I just stated? It's not as dramatic as when this first was published. You know, the effects. Are, so these these children survive. They, they don't necessarily get <clears throat> all of them severe diseases. But there is, there is an increased risk of obesity and <clears throat> allergic um, disorders. What, what happens in terms of the microbiome goes as initially... <clears throat> The first few months, you can definitely tell if a, a infant did not come through the birth canal and got inoculated by a combination of the vaginal and fecal microbiota of the mothers. Um, but later, you know, like after a year, you can't see a difference. But during that year, the damage has been done because the interactions with the immune system of the early microbiome has been interrupted. So it was not the same as if you had the, you know, the natural uh, inoculation. Later, the, the, the organisms come from the skin and from the environment and from... Um, so the system is resilient in terms of establishing a intact gut microbiome later on. But you had that window where the damage happened in terms of training, interaction with, with the immune system, um, and you know, increasing the risk for obesity, asthma, um, and a few other you know allergic and uh, um, uh, autoimmune diseases. So it's definitely a very important factor. Yeah. People are doing something to counteract this by you know taking a swipe from the vaginal uh, area and um, you know giving it to the infant after birth. How successful that is to prevent that that negative impact, I can't tell you. But it's it's so some people do it. I mean, there's another thing that is 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 dangerous, um, and that's the administration of antibiotics to women during delivery, or a even a one-time course of an antibiotic um, in the pregnant mother, which will have an impact on 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 the microbiome and, and on this. Um, transition, you know, from the mother to the to the infant of a healthy microbiome. So there, there are things that we know today, um, but medicine has not really responded in the appropriate way, in my opinion, having this knowledge. If you eat a largely plant-based diet, you're taking a risk that all these vegetables and fruits have been sprayed with insecticides and herbicides and increasing amounts um, that you would actually counteract the beneficial effect of, of this plant-based food. So organic has become an important consideration. Mm -hmm. I was never a huge fan of organic. I thought that this is an overkill, but that was totally out of ignorance, I would say. 
the problem is there's still a lot of loopholes in the organic, uh, you know, the getting the certification of uh, food being organic. Secondly, organic just means that nothing has been sprayed onto these plants um, on the plant surface. A big part of the life and the health of a plant goes on in the soil. And the soil has a very um, rich and diverse um, microbiome as well, just like our, our colon. Mm-hmm. And with healthy plants, their roots interact with these microbes. Uh, they attract these microbes by secreting some sugar containing liquid into the roots, and then the microbes come. The microbes stimulate the root system to produce these, these health beneficial. Um, botanicals, um, you know, flavonoids, flavanols, um, polyphenols um, that we know make one big component to the health benefit of plant-based foods. So there's fiber on the one side and there's polyphenols on the other side. With chemical agriculture, where you basically make these plants grow independent of what their roots are doing. You sort of kill that whole microbiome part of the plant. And the plant will contain much less of these health promoting molecules. It may look beautiful, you know, your, your carrots or your apples or whatever it may look beautiful, um, but it may not contain the same amount of these health promoting molecules. So, what's happened is a new category of regenerative organic has been coined. and. So far, you know, very few providers, growers actually stick to that. But it is something that is gaining ground and I think will will increasingly become popular and consumers will demand it. That is, <clears throat> they want plants to grow up without the external chemicals, but also without the chemicals from the, from the soil.